The M10 was the final result of a series of vehicles intended to give the tank destroyer branch a bigger gun. It was only an expedient vehicle, tank destroyers actually wanted something much more mobile, but they needed something now, and the 3-inch gun motor carriages T24, M5 and M9 didn't make the mustard. As a result, M10 was put into service. A lot of them did find their way across the water in Commonwealth service. The M10s were there known as gun 3-inch anti-tank on self-propelled mount M10. There was for the British, however, a bit of a problem. The 3-inch gun was the only one of its type in British service. Uh, as a result, this led to logistical problems and training problems, and it just wasn't worth the hassle. It's actually pretty similar to the problem they had with the 76mm Sherman. Perfectly fine system, but it used ammunition, which was not readily available in the British system. The result was pretty much the same for both. Remove the 3-inch high velocity, or the 76, and replace it with a 17-pounder. Now, oh, yes, the Firefly was a different turret, but you get the gist. It didn't hurt that the 17-pounder also had a very significant punch, but the important part was that it was in British service, it was being produced in British factories, ammunition was easy to come by, and it was in the supply system. Vehicles which had been converted were known as gun, 17-pounder, anti-tank, on self-propelled mount M10. Very creative name. After a while, the British decided they actually needed something a little bit catchier and shorter, and they came up with the name Achilles in early 1945. In order to distinguish between the different marks of M10, the Achilles Mark I was the M10 equivalent with a twin diesel engine. The Achilles Mark II was the version with the Ford V8. The Americans would know it as the M10A1. If it had a 17-pounder, they added the identifier C, the letter C. This was the standard nomenclature for a vehicle which had a 17-pounder on it. So, for example, the Sherman Firefly was known as the Sherman, say, 5C. As a result, the vehicle I'm standing in front of is an Achilles Mark 1C. Now, the astute of you will notice, looking at the mountlet, that that was actually not the end of the upgrades that this vehicle received, but we'll get to that a little later. As we start our tour of the hull, it occurs to me that things are going to start becoming a little bit redundant. After all, all the running gear on most of the American vehicles is pretty much derived from each other. So in this case, the M10's running gear comes from the M4 medium, the M4 medium has developed from the M3 medium, and so on and so forth. However, at least the hull on this is not actually an M4, although it was derived from it. So we'll start there. So the purpose of the tank destroyers were they were supposed to be more mobile than the tanks that they supported. As a result, the armor on this is thinner as a concession to mobility. It's only 1.5 inches, sloped at 55. Outside of that, though, most of the other features common to the American tanks you'll see, behind brush guard, the siren, and uh, service light, marker light, as you start moving back, you can see the hatch is a bit of a design flaw. You can't open or close it if the gun is to the front. Oops. There is no hull MG. Uh, Tank Destroyer Branch basically found its surplus requirements and it would blur the line a little bit too much between a basically an anti-tank gun and a tank. Not having an MG certainly reduced the temptation to play tank. Uh, indeed though, the T-49 early concepts did have a bow machine gun. Eventually Tank Destroyer Branch decided surplus to requirements. The Casting at the front for the nose, which covers the final drive, is pretty much standard design of the era. And finally, I will point out the blindingly obvious here. This is a British vehicle, the 17 pound, of course, being British gun. These are American markings. No, I cannot explain why somebody in the past time painted this up as an American tank destroyer. The Americans did consider the 17 pound conversion to be a good conversion. They liked it. However, because the 90mm could be dropped into the M10 just as easily, you know, effectively making the M36 predecessor, um, there was no need for the Americans to take the 17-pounder conversion. The 90mm was in production, they already had ammunition, so for basically the same reasons that the British went with 17-pounder, the Americans were very happy to continue with the 90, which in fairness was a better gun anyway. The tracks are common to the HVSS vehicles. They're 
16 and 9 16 of an inch wide, 6 inch pitch. They are double pin, they're connected by end connectors, which also function as the guide horns. The bogies themselves, three per side, each of which has two wheels with the distinctive vertical volute springs within them. Now, the bogies could be replaced either as entire components or as uh, individual pieces within the bogey. To give you an idea of the tension that goes on these springs, if you wanted to replace just one of the volute springs, you needed two five-ton jacks to do it. The system itself, if you wanted to remove the whole bogey, there are 16 bolts on the inside. So firstly, you would have to break track above the bogey, just make sure that it's not resting on either the return skid or the support roller. By the way, that's also the indicator. This is a heavy duty bogey, a later model, as opposed to the earlier one, which just had the re return roller on top. Uh, track's broken, undo the 16 bolts, out it comes, place on the new unit, 16 bolts back on, connect the track, you're done. Now this is one of the advantages of the bogey system. It is very, very easy to replace due to battle damage or anything else. The other advantage is that it takes no room inside the hull at all. There are no springs, uh, no bars or anything else. And this is part of the reason that the Germans were very fond of leaf spring suspensions as well, such as on the Panzer IV. Um, however, uh, of course, the bogey system does come with some disadvantages. In this case, especially on the VVSS, the amount of travel that you have. Now, to give an example of the problem, uh, although this vehicle is rated to cross a 7.5 foot trench, uh, it is, according to the manual, limited in the maximum height of a wall that it can cross at 18 inches. A vehicle like this not being able to cross higher than 18 inches is what I would call pathetic. And uh, if you think about it though, because of the way the wheels will, will travel on their support arms, anything bigger than that is basically going to function as a chalk block when it hits the wheel. Now if you did add the grazers, uh, then what you could do is scale, according to the manual, a 36 inch wall, which is a little bit better. but then you got to go through all the hassle of adding the grousers and so on, which a lot of times they didn't bother with. The other obvious difference between the M4 hull and that of the M10 is that the sides are angled outwards. Now, to reduce weight, they were reduced to three quarters of an inch in thickness. However, to add a little bit more protection, you have them at an angle. The catch, well, there's actually two of them. Firstly, obviously, the vehicle is now wider. This can lead to some difficulties in either narrow roads or railway loading gauges and so on and so forth. The other difference uh, is that this is actually a very hard vehicle to climb up on. And uh, my cameraman was noticing the same thing as well. Ordinarily, you come up to the side of the track, you use maybe the bogey wheel as a foot step, and you climb up that way. It doesn't work that way with, uh, with this vehicle. It gets a little bit more complicated. The skirts at the bottom, which come inwards, they're a quarter of an inch thick. And uh, really, they're not going to stop much more than a caliber 50 round. But hey, every bit helps. Uh, they are kind of hollow underneath, leave room for the tracks. The actual horizontal plate for the sponson is at the joint of the angles. The bosses that you see on the hull side and turret side are for additional armor, applique. The armor is spaced three quarters of an inch. And according to the manual, comes in multiple thicknesses as appropriate. Now, the reason that they are here in the first place was that Tank Destroyer Branch were kind of hedging their bets a little bit. Remembering that you are supposed to have a mobile vehicle, better than tanks, uh, but you have less armor. Now, the vehicle wasn't supposed to slug it out. What are you going to do? Well, it turned out in the end that Tank Destroyer Branch decided, you know, just in case, we'll put the bosses on, maybe we'll change our mind later. You know, that didn't happen in the end. Really, the only uses I can find uh, of the additional armor were the British. I'm not going to say that the Americans never put it on, but by and large, they didn't. Track tension is a bit of a chore. Now, the first thing you have to do is have to introduce you to Little Joe. Little Joe is located just above the exhaust and is a very, very large wrench. Coming back to the idler system, 
Uh, various components to be done here. Firstly, you have to unscrew these two locking bolts. You then screw in the spreader bolt, and this opens up the, uh, the casing around the idler arm. These two little holes here are supposed to hold the retaining clip, which holds this locking uh, clamp here. Knock this out of the way, it frees up the serrations. You can then use little Joe and a couple of lads to lever the idler wheel forwards or backwards. When you're done, put back the locking plate back onto the clip, loosen the spreader bolt, tighten the clamps, and finally you're done. While we're back here, we can also see one of the easiest identifiers of a Mark I or a Mark II Achilles, and uh, that is the exhaust. So on this diesel-powered system, you have two short little exhausts. Uh, if you were to look at the V8-powered one, there is actually a large baffle or grill uh, at the rear under the slope. And uh, the other obvious difference is going to be on the engine deck, but nine times out of ten, if you're standing next to the vehicle, you can't see the engine deck. Other things here, obviously you have your tow pintle for towing whatever it is that somebody decided would be a good idea to tow. A couple of uh, mounts here for your tow cable. And of course, all the tools are located at the top of the rear slope. So after great difficulty and off camera to save my embarrassment, I finally managed to make my way up onto the engine deck of the M10. This brings us straight to the travel lock, uh, the external one. There is an internal one as well, uh, or since this is a British vehicle, I guess, the gun clutch. It's the same thing. It's like fume extractor, bore evacuator, trunk, boot, and so on. I, I confuse the heck out of people over here with my Englishisms. Anyway, uh, the problem with the M10 in movement was that there was an issue with the gun basically bouncing around, even with the internal travel lock. As a result, it was pretty much mandated that if you're moving at all, unless you really expect contact around the corner, spin the turret over the rear, use the travel lock. Now, the problem with this is that this is a purely manual traverse turret. And you can imagine how much fun you would have had trying to crank the turret around every time just because you felt you had to go somewhere. Other features up on here. Uh, firstly, you can also see the difference between a, a diesel-powered M10 and the petrol one. We already mentioned the exhaust. The other one is the engine deck. The Ford V8 has a slightly larger grills. But similar enough, the diesel ones fold up and outwards. On the outside, you can see that there are three ports per side for diesel, oil, and water. The engines themselves, it is a General Motors model 6046. Uh, they are twin six-cylinder, two-cycle diesels, water-cooled, of course. Combined total, 375 horsepower, 2100 RPM. Uh, each engine is 425 cubic inches. This would be enough to total the vehicle along at 30 miles an hour in a sprint. The sustained speed, according to the manual, is 25 miles an hour. The two engines are entirely independent with their own cooling, fuel, generation systems, and so on. They can be run independently, simply disconnect one by use of the clutch, and they can limp along with the other. The engines were labeled LC and LA, LC for the left engine, LA for the right, and all the parts for each engine had that LC or LA identifier. And I'm not entirely sure why, because you would have thought they would be fairly identical. But anyway, each engine takes 32 quarts of oil. Add in 24 more quarts for general lubrication systems. The air cleaners, you can see them three on each side, they're the wet type, they each take 21 quarts. The powertrain, 38 gallons, yes, yeah, gallons of lubricants. And finally, the water cooling system is 15 gallons each. That's quite a substantial amount of POL you got to keep track of. Uh, POL is petroleum, oil, and lubricants, also known as class three in today's army. Finally, for fuel, there's an upper 69 gallon tank on each side, a 14 and a half lower on each side, giving a grand total of 167 US gallons. This gave the vehicle a cruising range of about 140 miles. 
Other thing while I'm up here, I'll just mention the counterweights. Now, uh, initially, the first vehicles had the grousers for the tracks mounted on them. The vehicle was equipped with 26 grousers, 10 for each track, and six spares. However, the turret was out of balance. They had to add wedge counterweights. The grousers were then moved to the hull sides. The later model counterweights are these duckbill type. Uh, they're a little bit longer, they extend out further, but they do add a little bit of space for some stowage. There is a two-shot external fire extinguisher handle located on the left rear of the engine deck. While I'm on the counterweights, you'll see a number of these little sticks around the ring of the turret. You simply put them all up and you attach a canvas cover. It gives you a little bit of overhead protection against the elements. So now we've moved into the turret and uh, I'm just going to leave you with this image as we break for part two.